I had sponsored Willow for seven years, and I had also loved her for seven years, she finally agreed to be with me, but later, I found out that she liked the childhood friend she grew up with, she had always hated me, believing that I humiliated her by throwing money at her. For ten years after our marriage, she was extremely cold to me, and in the end, she simply moved out to live with her childhood friend, and I was left alone, guarding an empty house, and died in despair. After I was reborn back to the day I decided to sponsor her, Willow's childhood friend stood in front of her and shouted at me, Do you think you're so great just because you have money? We don't need your charity. I laughed. You've got it wrong. I wouldn't sponsor you even if I had to burn the money. Chapter 1. George. You think you're something just because you have some stinking money? Do you think having money makes you special? We don't need it. As I looked at Makoto, who was standing protectively in front of Willow, I felt a bit disoriented, my gaze meeting Willow's. Twenty-year-old Willow still had a hint of innocence on her face, wearing a linen dress that had faded from too many washes, but she was too beautiful, tall and slender, with porcelain white skin, and her eyes shone like stars, making even the worn dress look elegant. I couldn't help but take a step back, grabbing the table behind me to steady myself. How long had it been since I'd seen Willow like this? Ten years? Or twenty years? It had been so long that I couldn't remember. After all, it was something from my past life. Willow was slightly startled when she saw me step back. Makoto kept babbling, but I couldn't hear anything anymore. Everything in front of me was exactly the same as it had been in my previous life. Back then, she didn't want my sponsorship, but I insisted on giving it to her. I had loved Willow for seven years, and I knew her family was struggling. Her father was a degenerate gambler who would drink himself into a stupor after losing all his money, then come home to beat her and her mother. Her mother couldn't bear the abuse and eventually committed suicide by drowning. Willow had been collecting trash and working odd jobs since she was a child, and she relied on scholarships to get through school. I, on the other hand, had grown up in a wealthy family, and we shouldn't have had any intersection, but she was always a top student, so our private high school, in pursuit of higher graduation rates, gave her a scholarship, and we ended up attending the same school. At that time, our circle was full of spoiled rich kids, and none of us were interested in studying. We spent our days idly waiting to go abroad, get a degree and come back to inherit our family businesses. Only Willow was different. She had clear goals, studied hard during class, and worked after school. Although she had no money, she never saw it as something to be ashamed of. She was always dignified and unyielding. She was too unique, like a beautiful and resilient wild orchid growing in a greenhouse, completely out of place among the surrounding decadent flowers. That's when I fell in love with her. I loved her, so I couldn't bear to see her suffer. Back then, I was young and naive always thinking that I knew what was best for her. She had to work at night and couldn't make it to breakfast in the morning, so I would bring her lunch from home. Willow, the wagyu beef my family's chef makes is the best, you should try it. And the foie gras, my dad had it flown in specially, it's delicious. I was the only child in my family, raised with every comfort, and everyone around me pampered me. Their excessive pampering has left my mind blank. I just wanted to give her the best, but I completely ignored whether she wanted it or not. Our classmates would tease. George. What does she know about foie gras? She probably can't even afford chicken liver. I scolded them. Mind your own damn business. I didn't notice Willow's fingers turn white as she gripped the lunchbox tightly. After a moment, she returned the lunchbox to me and coldly said, Thanks for the offer, but no thanks. Don't be like that. Willow. A girl winked at her. If you get with George, you'll never have to work again. Just grab the opportunity. Yeah, then your dad can gamble as much as he wants, and he won't have to touch your tuition money anymore. Ha ha ha. Everyone burst into laughter. I slammed the table and stood up. Shut the hell up. They stopped laughing, but Willow suddenly stood up and walked out. I chased after her, trying to give her the lunchbox. Willow, don't listen to them. Just eat the food, or you'll be too tired after working tonight. She stopped and suddenly turned around. I froze. Her eyes were full of hatred and disgust. Chapter 2. Teenagers have a terrible memory. I quickly forgot about that incident and continued to pursue Willow. For her. I even started studying seriously and ended up attending the same university as her. My father was so pleased that he doubled my allowance. University made Willow even busier. Her scholarship application was rejected, and the poverty subsidy was taken by a classmate who had connections. At her lowest point, she could only afford a single bun from the cafeteria each day, and she filled up on free soup. I couldn't stand to watch this and offered to sponsor her, but she refused. She worked three jobs a day and eventually collapsed from exhaustion on the street. I couldn't bear it anymore and grabbed her, insisting on giving her money. Willow, why won't you take my money? What are you trying to prove by working yourself to death? I went to her class advisor and forcibly paid her tuition. By then, I had matured a bit and knew to consider her pride. So when we ate, 
I always pulled her along and pretended I couldn't finish my food, asking her to share it with me. When we went out, I would claim I had gotten free tickets and insisted she come along, gradually. It seemed like Willow and I were getting closer. I sponsored her until graduation, even sponsoring her childhood friend Makoto to make her happy. After graduation, Willow started her own business. She had always been an excellent student, and during school, she developed a stock trading software with her friends, but they faced numerous rejections and couldn't secure any investments. I couldn't stand to see her so disheartened, so I asked my father to invest in her company. I remember that night, Willow was unusually silent. As I held her, almost falling asleep, she suddenly spoke, George, why do you do all this? At the time, I thought she was asking why I was so good to her, so I confidently replied, because I like you, Willow, do you like me? I held her hand, I've been so good to you, if you don't be with me, it would be really ungrateful. I was just joking at the time, but Willow didn't say anything, and I thought she had agreed by default, and so, we got together. Two years later, Willow and I got married, the wedding was simple, Willow said she didn't like crowds. So we only invited a few close relatives and friends. They were all my relatives and friends. On her side, she was the only one. Willow remained distant even after we got married. I was foolish back then, thinking it was just her nature, and that if I kept being good to her, I would eventually melt her heart, even if it was made of stone. But I didn't expect that her heart could never be warmed, because her heart had always belonged to someone else. In the third year of our marriage, our conflicts became irreconcilable. I couldn't stand her coldness day after day and confronted her. Asking if she still loved her childhood friend, she just stared at me coldly without saying a word. When I pushed her too hard, she simply slammed the door and left. Her coldness drove me to madness and obsession. Every time she came back, I would confront her, argue with her, and in our worst fights, I would lose control and say, if I had known you were such an ungrateful wretch, I would have raised a dog instead, at least it would wag its tail at me. For a moment, her expression showed anger, but she quickly calmed down, after that day. She stopped coming home altogether. I later found out that she had been with her childhood friend all along. They had built a new home together. And even, she was pregnant with his child. Those years, she lived a happy and fulfilled life outside. While I was left alone in an empty house, my once overflowing love had turned into a poison. Filled with hatred, Willow became successful in her business. She was richer than my father. I had nothing left to use against her. The only thing I had was our marriage. I staked my life on revenge against her. I refused to divorce her. No matter how much money she offered, she had destroyed me, and I would never let her live in peace. The men she loved would always be nothing more than a shadowy third party. The child she had with him would always be an illegitimate child, born in the dark. Willow didn't dare to take me to court, fearing that a public divorce would affect her company's stock price, and the other board members wouldn't agree to it. So, we dragged on for ten years. During those ten years, no matter how hysterical, how crazy I became, even when I eventually softened and begged her. She never wavered, never came back to see me, I wasted away day by day in despair, growing weaker as I fell ill. In the end, I died in misery. Chapter 3, George. I snapped back to reality and looked at Willow beside me. An overwhelming hatred surged through my entire body, making my heart feel like it was about to explode. For a moment, I could barely stand. After I died, she must have finally gotten what she wanted. Perhaps, the way she treated me was meant to hasten my death. I still remember how my medication was suddenly switched before I died. When I asked the butler, he simply said it was a milder drug. I didn't suspect anything. However, not long after taking that medication, my health began to deteriorate rapidly, until I couldn't even sit up anymore. It wasn't long before I breathed my last. It was her, wasn't it? Who else could it have been? She hated me that much, enough to want me dead immediately. She wanted to marry Makoto. How cruel she was. I looked at Willow forcibly suppressing the urge to lunge at her and end her life right then and there. I was filled with such hatred. I believe that, aside from being too young and not understanding how to protect her pride, I had never done anything to wrong Willow. I didn't even force her into marriage. I had even asked her if she wanted to marry me, and if she didn't, I would have waited. And yet, she hated me this much. Makoto, just like in my previous life, shouted at me, George, do you think you're so great just because you have money? What gives you the right to insult people like this? Take your filthy money and get lost. I looked at him. Makoto wasn't bad looking. He just appeared a bit shabby in his worn out sportswear, staring at me with agitation. This was the man Willow loved, the one she would rather kill me to be with. It was the same in my past life. Willow and I were having a decent conversation when I suggested she could repay me the tuition fees after she started earning money, treating it as a loan. But Makoto suddenly accused me of throwing money at her, claiming I was humiliating Willow. It was only later, 
During my arguments with Willow, that I slowly realized, she had always believed that I was throwing money at her, humiliating her, I suddenly found it all quite laughable. Looking at Makoto's protective stance, I smirked, you've got it all wrong, I wouldn't sponsor you two even if I had to burn the money. Willow's expression changed drastically. Chapter 4 Makoto's expression went blank for a moment. What did you say? I smiled. You think my sponsorship is an insult to you, don't you? We're classmates. How could I insult you like that? If that's how you feel, then forget it. You two can continue working your jobs. Makoto's family situation was similar to Willow's. His father had fled with debts, leaving his mother to work herself into illness to support his education. And now she could only lie bedridden at home. Maybe because of their similar circumstances, he and Willow had always been close and he was always around her. He often liked to tag along whenever Willow and I went out. Sometimes when I was reluctant, he would confront me in front of Willow. George, are you avoiding me because I'm poor? Do you not want to be friends with me? Before I could even respond, Willow would link arms with him and say in a serious tone, if you think we're not good enough, then we won't go. I had no choice but to take him along. During meals, he would stare at the lobster on his plate and say, do you eat this well every day? We really do live in different worlds don't we? Several times, just when Willow and I were having a good conversation, he would suddenly say something like that, and Willow's smile would fade, and she would stop talking to me. At first, I thought he was just being thoughtless, but later, once, when Willow and I were walking together, I turned back to say something to him and caught the look in his eyes. Makoto's face was expressionless, but his eyes were filled with malice and hatred. When he saw me turn around, he was caught off guard and quickly forced a smile, but all I felt was a chill down my spine. It was then that I realized, he despised me, or rather, he hated me, actually. Right after Willow and I got married, there was a brief period of harmony. At that time, her company was starting to take off, and she secured her first big contract. After the celebration, she drunkenly wrapped her arms around me, smiling as she said, Honey, what do you like? Your wife will buy it for you. I felt sorry for her, knowing how hard it was for her to earn money, so I held her. Content. There's no need. Your company is just getting started and you need the money. I'm happy just knowing you care, but she wouldn't let it go. Hanging onto my neck and pouting. My husband should spend the money I earn. I'll buy you a car. What kind of car do you like? Even as she fell asleep, she was still murmuring. George, I have money now. You don't have to compromise with me or suffer with me anymore. Sure enough, the next day, she bought me a car. But before I could even respond, Makoto showed up. He looked at the car keys in my hand with a strange expression. Then he suddenly snatched the keys from me. Smiling at Willow as he said, Oh, I remember George had a car like this when he was in college. A friend gave it to him, right? He used to complain that it was too cheap to drive around. Whether that was true or not, I had long forgotten. But Willow's expression immediately darkened. She took the keys from him without a word and left. After that, she started to grow distant from me. The next time I saw the car, it was Makoto driving it. With a smile playing on his lips, he pretended to be nonchalant as he said, George. Willow gave me the car. You're not upset, are you? Of course. I demanded that he return the car to me. A flash of resentment crossed his face as he loudly asked. You have so many cars. Why do you have to fight me for this one? You have so much, and I only have this one. Willow angrily pulled me away. Let go, if you didn't want it. Why fight him for it? Or do you just like to compete for things? At the time, I was too proud to take such an insult, and we ended up having a big argument that didn't end well. It wasn't until later that I understood. Makoto wasn't talking about the car, he was talking about Willow, he thought I had taken her away from him, which was why he hated me so much. Chapter 5 George Willow suddenly grabbed my arm in a panic, as if realizing something was terribly wrong. Wait. I turned back, only to be momentarily stunned by the look on her face. There was an intense turmoil in her eyes, as if something deep inside her was about to break free. Even her voice trembled slightly. No, this isn't right. George why aren't you sponsoring me anymore? Don't you like me a lot? Her sudden desperation shocked me. What was wrong with Willow? Had she lost her mind? Or was she angry about the way I spoke to Makoto? But in my previous life, at this point, I hadn't even won her over yet. She had always been cold and indifferent to me, never showing any warmth. Had she gone mad? I tried to shake her off, let go. But she only held on tighter, her eyes even reddening slightly. George, do you not like me anymore? Are you abandoning me? This time, I was genuinely scared. When had Willow ever said something like this to me? I widened my eyes in disbelief. Willow, have you lost your mind? Or are you possessed? But she didn't answer, just stared at me intensely. Her gaze filled with obsession and madness. My temper flared up. She had treated me so horribly in my past life. 
And now she dared to glare at me like this. Didn't you think my sponsorship was humiliating you, Willow, or are you just shamelessly waiting for me to beg you, to live off me? Makoto opened his mouth, clearly not expecting me to speak to Willow this way. Of course, in my previous life, this was the time when I was most infatuated with her. I had been careful with every word, afraid of hurting her pride, but now, I didn't care at all. Willow, who do you think you are? I sneered, ungrateful and treacherous. I wondered how I could have ever fallen for someone like her, but instead of getting angry, Willow's face drained of color, leaving her deathly pale. I yanked my hand away from her grip and left without looking back. Chapter 6 The card I had given to Willow had 200,000 yuan on it. It was enough to cover her tuition and living expenses. I took the card and spent the money myself instead. If giving her the money only led to trouble, I might as well buy myself a new watch. At least it would tell me the time. In my previous life, apart from that one car, Willow never gave me anything. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. I always carefully picked out gifts for her, but she never seemed to remember, or maybe she just didn't care. Meanwhile, Makoto had turned into a rich playboy overnight. He spent Willow's money on everything, cars, watches, clothes, spending hundreds of thousands at a time. Every time he bought something new, he would come flaunted in front of me. George, Willow got this for me from Paris. What did she get you? He would smirk. Nothing, I bet. And then Willow and I would have a huge fight, making our relationship even worse. Looking back now, I wonder why I ever cared so much about what she gave me. I could buy anything I wanted myself. So, I added another 100,000 to the 200,000 and bought myself a Vakaran Constantine. As I got off the bus back to school, I unexpectedly ran into Makoto and Willow. When Makoto saw the new watch on my wrist, his expression changed, filled with barely concealed hatred and jealousy. At this point, Willow was still dirt poor, and so was he. The sweatpants he was wearing were fraying at the edges, even though he had tried to trim the loose threads and iron them flat. But anyone could tell at a glance that they were cheap clothes bought from a roadside stall. George, you really are rich. He stared intently at my wrist, his fists clenched tightly. A Vakaran Constantine. That's really expensive. Just one watch costs more than our tuition for several years. He leaned close to Willow, saying deliberately, we really do live in different worlds, don't we? In the past, whenever he said something like this, I would always try to explain, but my words usually made Willow even more unhappy. Now, I couldn't care less, I smiled slightly. It seems you're not just poor, you're also not very bright. It took you this long to figure it out. My family lives in a 500 square meter villa in the city center. You live in a 30 square meter rundown apartment on the outskirts. Of course, we're not from the same world. Makoto's face turned green, and his features twisted momentarily. I walked up to him and spoke slowly, enunciating each word. Makoto, you will never be part of my world. You can die of jealousy if you like. Willow. He quickly tried to play the victim with Willow. I scoffed. What else can you do besides cling to a woman? You're like a cockroach in the gutter. There's no need to look for Willow. You two are equally disgusting, like peas in a pod. Chapter 7 After cursing out those two scumbags, I went home feeling quite satisfied. It wasn't that I didn't want to get revenge on them, I still remembered how they drugged me in my past life, but, for one, the drugging hadn't happened yet in this life, so I had no evidence, and two, I wasn't about to waste my life on garbage like them. The torment of my previous life had been painful enough. In this life, I just wanted to stay away from those two. Whether they thrived or suffered, it had nothing to do with me anymore. I wanted a fresh start. However, even though I wanted to stay away from them, they seemed determined to haunt me. A few days later, a friend came to find me, grinning as he delivered the news. You didn't sponsor Willow and Makoto, so now they're in a real mess. They can't even afford their tuition. I heard Willow's been working herself to the bone, and the other day, Makoto wanted to buy a new pair of pants. But even after trying to pay with WeChat, Alipay, and his card, he couldn't scrape together the 80 yuan. He had to sell that iPhone you bought him just to barely cover his tuition. It took me a moment to remember that. In my past life, before this point, I had noticed Willow's phone was outdated, so I bought her the latest iPhone 14 Pro Max. However, the very next day, I saw that phone in Makoto's hand. I lowered my eyes and mocked. Is that so? They really are broke. I hadn't walked more than a few steps before Makoto blocked my path. He was visibly agitated, grabbing me with indignation. George, why aren't you sponsoring Willow anymore? Do you realize her GPA is the highest in her major? If she can't continue because of tuition, can you live with that? At first, I was stunned. Then I couldn't help but laugh. In my previous life, I eventually figured out what kind of people they really were. They wanted someone else's money but didn't want to swallow their pride. They would take the food off your plate and then curse you for giving it to them. The epitome of shamelessness. 
Whether she's top of her class or not has nothing to do with me. I shrugged. I'm not her father. How can you say that? Some classmates who knew us gathered around, and Makoto, emboldened, pointed at me as if I were some sort of villain. You have a watch that's worth more than our tuition for years. What's the big deal about sponsoring us? Or are you just so selfish that you'd rather waste your money than help someone in need? He probably thought everyone was like Willow, easily swayed by his shameless arguments. Before I could respond, my friend spoke up. His family's wealth was on par with mine, but he had a much shorter fuse. He sneered at Makoto. What mental institution left its doors unlocked and let you out? You idiot. If you need money, go beg for it. Or better yet, sell yourself. Even though you're ugly, someone might pay 80 yuan per time. Do it 10 times for 800 yuan, and after 100 times, you'll have enough for tuition. You've got arms, legs, and a brain. Why the hell are you begging other people for money? Is everyone supposed to be your dad? Makoto, who was used to being sneaky and passive-aggressive, was stunned into silence by such a direct confrontation. Other classmates chimed in, yeah, if you're broke, apply for financial aid. You can't just go around demanding money from people with that attitude. Shameless. No wonder you're broke. Makoto took a step back, his eyes wide with disbelief. I sneered. I often treated my classmates to meals and outings. So naturally, they sided with me. Looking back, what did Makoto have besides Willow? He couldn't beat me in anything. If I hadn't been so obsessed with Willow in my past life, someone like him wouldn't have even crossed my path. Just then. Willow appeared. Willow. Makoto hurried over to her, ready to play the victim. I just asked George to sponsor you. He has enough money to buy all these watches, but he won't help you. I don't know what I did to offend him, but he insulted me terribly. George. He immediately changed his tone, speaking softly. I know you look down on me, but I'm only thinking of Willow. She's so talented. I felt a wave of disgust. Makoto was like a leech. He didn't bite, but he was annoying as hell. The most infuriating part was that he was like a ghost. Impossible to get rid of. Willow frowned slightly. Did you insult him? I couldn't help but laugh mockingly. Of course. She was always like this. The moment Makoto acted pitiful, she would immediately scold me without even asking what happened. In the past, I would jump up and argue with her, then secretly feel hurt, but not anymore. I lifted my gaze to Willow. Yes, he's right. I did insult him, but to my surprise, Willow didn't get angry. She lowered her head, her tone soft, almost pleading. Then he must have done something wrong to upset you. She then turned to Makoto, her voice cold. George isn't unreasonable. Apologize to him. I was dumbfounded. For a moment, I wondered if I was still dreaming. Makoto was equally shocked. After a long pause, he stammered in disbelief. Willow, what are you saying? Willow's face darkened. I told you to apologize. Makoto's expression shifted from shock to anger. How can you do this? I was just as bewildered. Willow, the girl who held Makoto in her heart was actually telling him to apologize to me. Had she lost her mind? A fleeting thought crossed my mind. Could it be that she was reborn too? But I quickly dismissed the idea. No way. In my past life, Willow hated me so much. She even drugged and killed me. If she had been reborn, she would have stayed as far away from me as possible. She must have some other scheme. I stepped back, eyeing her warily. Willow seemed hurt by my reaction, looking at me with wounded eyes. George, I know I was wrong before. Will you forgive me? Don't you still like me? Let's be together. I'll make up for everything I owe you. The more she spoke, the more agitated she became. By the end, she was staring at me as if I were some long-lost treasure, her voice even trembling slightly. This was absurd. I couldn't help but clench my fists. In my past life, I had chased after her, wasted my entire life, all for her to say those words. But even at the end, she never told me she liked me. Yet now, after I had cursed her and humiliated her, she was telling me she liked me. What about everything I had sacrificed in my past life? I curled my lips into a sneer, my voice dripping with disdain. Be with you. Willow, who do you think you are? What makes you think you're good enough to be with me? My clothes cost more than you could earn in three years of work. You're too full of yourself. What makes you think you deserve to be with me? Didn't she feel humiliated by me? Then let her feel what real humiliation was. Sure enough, Willow's face turned white. She hastily said, I may not have money now, but just wait. I'll be rich one day. Well. She wasn't wrong about that. She did end up making a lot of money, but what did that have to do with me? The hatred and disgust in my heart were almost unbearable. I looked at her with contempt and said, Willow, even if every woman in the world died, I still wouldn't be with you. Chapter 8 After I left that day, Willow kept staring at me, looking lost and forlorn. She looked pitiful. Her shoulders seemed to slump, and she stood there as if her soul had been drained. But I felt nothing but cold disdain. I didn't know what Willow was up to. Whether she had suddenly come to her senses or had simply lost her mind, 
The George who once loved her unconditionally was long dead in my past life. He was never coming back. Without my sponsorship, Willow and Makoto were having an even worse time in this life than in the last. Willow's software didn't sell, and her attempt at starting a business failed. I heard they were so broke now that they were close to selling their blood, but none of that was my concern anymore. The next morning, my phone rang. I picked it up, and the screen showed the name, Anna. She was an old friend of mine. I felt a bit disoriented. It had been over 10 years since I had last seen that name. When I was with Willow, she didn't like me having female friends. Nor did she like my second generation rich buddies. Slowly, I drifted away from many of my old friends. Anna and I had been family friends since childhood, and our relationship was always good. The car she gave me for my birthday during university was from her. I only remembered now that she had said it was a gift from her father after she landed a big deal. She had told me to cherish it, but back then, my heart was full of willow, and I had no space for any other woman. That car ended up sitting and used at home. When I answered the call, her excited voice came through the phone. George, I heard you finally put Willow in her place. Before I could say anything, she continued excitedly, it's about time, she's been using you and manipulating you. We didn't dare say anything before, but you've finally come to your senses. I smiled slightly. What's up? There's a gathering tonight, same old place, 8 o'clock, you've got to be there. After hanging up, it took me a while to remember that the old place was a bar we used to frequent. A bunch of us childhood friends often went there together, but after getting involved with Willow, I stopped going out much, I used to be reckless and headstrong, but for love, I had clipped my own wings, I stopped going to the mall, and for the first time, I learned to shop at street stalls and markets, I stopped wearing luxury brands and carefully picked out clothes that cost just a few dozen yuan, just so that Willow wouldn't frown when standing beside me, I avoided the restaurants I used to frequent, and when we did eat out, it was just cheap meals at small local joints, I had turned myself into a timid and cautious person, all in the hope that she might love me a little more. I used to love her so deeply, with all my heart. When I arrived at the bar that night, Anna was delighted and kept urging me to drink. I didn't refuse, enjoying this long-forgotten sense of ease. These friends were genuinely good people, especially Anna. When I got married, she even told me to come to her if I ever felt wronged, and she'd take care of Willow for me, and she did go after Willow. At that time, Willow had just gotten pregnant. I was overjoyed, thinking that having a child would finally bring her back to me and I eagerly awaited the birth of this little life, but later, I found out that the child wasn't mine, it was Makoto's, I went mad, smashing everything in the house and screaming at Willow, and then Makoto took it even further, deliberately calling me in the middle of the night, letting me hear him and Willow being intimate, his heavy breathing, mixed with the sound of bodies colliding, echoed through the phone, relax, my stomach churned, and I clung to the toilet, vomiting until I was dizzy, I vomited until bile and stomach acid came up, and by the end, I was freezing, shivering uncontrollably. When I looked up, the man in the mirror was pale, with bloodshot eyes, filled with emptiness. Tears and snot streamed down my face. When Anna found out, she stormed into our house and slapped Willow. If I hadn't stopped her, she might have torn all of Willow's hair out. As I held her back, her eyes were red as she screamed at Willow. You heartless bitch. George treated you so well, and this is how you repay him. Willow didn't fight back that time. Blood trickled from the corner of her mouth and she stood there silently, head bowed, what are you thinking about, Anna nudged me, drink, I clinked glasses with her and downed the drink, after a few rounds, Anna was tipsy, her face flushed as she leaned closer and whispered, you really don't like that willow anymore, I glanced at her, and she quickly averted her eyes, her ears turning pink, I couldn't help but find it amusing, Anna liked me, I knew that, but in my past life, my eyes were only for willow, and I even fell out with Anna because of her, but when willow treated me poorly, Anna was the first to stand up and defend me. If I were to find a wife in this life, I'd want someone like her. Now I understood that sometimes love couldn't solve everything. Willow and I were worlds apart in background, upbringing, and circumstances. She grew up in a harsh environment, with sharp edges and deep-seated insecurities, cold and aloof. I was raised in a loving family, which gave me the confidence to give up everything for love, but it also became the reason for my downfall. I thought love could conquer all but I didn't realize that someone like Willow couldn't be changed by love alone. I nodded. Yeah, I was blind before. Anna lowered her head, slowly leaning closer to me, whispering, then what about me? Before she could finish, someone suddenly grabbed my arm. Startled, I turned around to see Willow's face, pale and tense. Her eyes were downcast, her body stiff, and her voice was calm but carried an undercurrent of emotion I couldn't understand. Come with me. I didn't want to cause a scene in front of my friends, so I reluctantly followed her outside let go. As soon as we were outside, I yanked my arm away, disgusted. 
What the hell is wrong with you? What kind of crazy act are you pulling now? Willow didn't respond, just stared at me intently. Since my rebirth, her attitude towards me had been submissive, almost as if she were trying to please me, but now, her eyes were red rimmed, her expression strained, she croaked, George, what did you just say? I froze, then gritted my teeth and said, I said I don't like you anymore, I was blind before. Don't like me anymore? Willow let out a strange laugh, then she grabbed my collar, her eyes locking onto mine, her voice as cold as ice, say that again. George, all those times you said you loved me, said you wanted to be with me, said you'd never leave me, were they all lies? Her expression was crazed, but I was stunned, something wasn't right, I hadn't said any of those things to her in this life, those were the words I had said to her before we got married in my past life, how could she possibly know that? Chapter 9 Willow quickly realized she had said something wrong and instinctively took a step back. I spoke in a low voice. Willow, you've come back too, haven't you? She was silent. The midnight wind howled as it swept past, dragging dead leaves across the ground, filling the air with a cold, desolate chill. Occasionally, a car would pass by, its lights flashing briefly before fading into the darkness. Willow, I forced a bitter smile. How dare you? She had really come back too, after all she did to me in the last life. How could she dare to say those things to me now? In my previous life, I had said those words to her, and I had meant them, but what was the result? I died with endless regret. In this life, I finally wanted to move on, to live a better life, but she had the audacity to rip open my wounds again, mocking me with the fact that I could never escape the misery of my past. Willow seemed flustered. George, let me explain. Yes, I was reborn, but I've come to understand things now. I was so stupid in the last life, I didn't realize that I had already fallen in love with you. I'll make it up to you. Okay. I. Slap. Willow's head snapped to the side. I had never hit a woman before. Even in my previous life, when she betrayed me, I never laid a finger on her. But I didn't regret this slap. I spoke slowly, deliberately. Willow. How dare you? How dare she? After hurting me so deeply, so casually tell me that she had loved me all along. I had put all my anger and pain into that slap. Using every ounce of strength I had, blood seeped from the corner of her mouth, but she simply wiped it away, her tone eerily calm, is that enough? If you're still not satisfied, she grabbed my hand and pressed it against her swollen cheek, hit me again, as many times as you need, even though her words were harsh, her eyes suddenly reddened, and tears began to fall, I was shocked, Willow had never cried in front of me before, in the last life, even during her most difficult times, when her father gambled away all her hard-earned tuition money and then beat her, she didn't cry as she went to school the next day, bruised and battered. She worked three jobs a day, fainting from hunger and exhaustion multiple times, but she didn't cry then either. I had once believed that she had a heart of stone, but now, she was shedding tears in front of me, her tears mixed with the blood at the corner of her mouth, and she looked utterly defeated. Her body hunched over, and she begged, George, come back, if you hate me, you can kill me if you want just don't leave me. I felt like I was going crazy. Willow, are you out of your mind? What the hell is wrong with you? She lowered her head, her voice trembling. I was so insecure. Back then, I was constantly on guard, thinking that everyone was out to hurt me. You were so good, so exceptional, completely out of my league. I didn't dare to love you, and I didn't dare to believe that you truly loved me. I was terrified that after I let myself be happy, one day you'd tell me that I wasn't good enough, that you were just playing with me. George, I was so stupid and I deserve to die. You can hit me or curse me. I don't care. Just please come back. She was sobbing now, as if she needed to release all the emotions she had been holding in. You don't know what those years after you left were like for me. I couldn't hold back anymore and let out a cold laugh. Willow, weren't you in love with Makoto? Didn't you drug me to death for him in the last life? Drugged. Willow froze. What do you mean, drugged? Don't play dumb. I gripped the railing by the roadside, afraid that if I didn't, I might hit her again. My medication was switched. My health had been improving, but after that, it kept getting worse until, I bit down hard on my tongue, the bitterness spreading in my mouth, the woman I loved had killed me for another man, even just recounting it was unbearable, I didn't. Willow cried out desperately, I never did that. I even told the butler to take good care of you, how could I possibly want to kill you? We locked eyes, and a realization dawned on both of us, if it wasn't her, the only other person who had access to my medication, who wanted me dead. It had to be Makoto, so it was Makoto who killed me. My heart was filled with conflicting emotions, but I wasn't surprised, I was already dead. Did it really matter who killed me? Even if it wasn't Willow, Makoto had killed me for her sake, so she wasn't completely innocent. I felt a deep weariness, a fatigue that seeped into my bones. 
Whether it was love or hate, I was truly exhausted. In this life, I just wanted to stay far away from her and live in peace. The autumn rain came suddenly, pelting the ground with cold, hard droplets. Willow stood in the rain, looking utterly pitiful, her face wet with either rain or tears. George, I'm begging you. And what about Makoto? I asked, my face devoid of emotion. You two had a child in the last life. What about that? Willow fell silent. After a long while, she finally spoke, her voice strained. He got me drunk. We only did it that one time. I let out a bitter, mocking laugh, saying nothing. Willow lowered her head even further. From the beginning to the end, the only person I ever loved was you. I never loved Makoto. She continued. Just then, a cold, menacing male voice suddenly echoed from the darkness nearby. Then what am I to you? Chapter 10. Makoto stepped out from the shadows. He was still wearing that old tracksuit, now soaked from the rain, clinging tightly to his body. Willow, he said his expression blank, but madness flickering in his eyes, you love him, so what does that make me, what do all these years I spent with you mean, Willow clenched her fists tightly, and the look she gave him was no longer one of her usual tenderness, but pure hatred, it was clear that Makoto hadn't been reborn, he was still the same Makoto from the previous life, he hadn't poisoned me in this life, so there was nothing I could take revenge for, Willow understood this too and said nothing, Makoto was stunned, you hate me, Willow, you actually hate me, if it weren't for you constantly driving a wedge between George and me, we wouldn't have ended up like this, she replied coldly, driving a wedge, Makoto laughed, Willow, he dropped the pretense entirely, if it weren't for your own insecurities and arrogance, how could I have manipulated you, it's your own twisted mind, you wanted him, but you were too scared, so you kept hanging around me, trying to make him jealous, to prove to yourself that he loved you, to feed your sick need, and now you're blaming it all on me, Willow's nails dug into her palms, George, Makoto tilted his head, his expression one of feigned innocence, as if he were asking a trivial question, you had everything, so why did you have to take Willow from me? He didn't seem to need an answer, continuing on his own, you had a good background, good looks, everyone fawned over you, loved you, adored you, anything you wanted, they'd bring to you without you even needing to ask, so many people loved you, why did you have to take Willow from me? His voice began to tremble with bitterness and rage, she was all I had, why, when I only had one person? did you have to take her too? You already had so much. I remained calm and said, Willow is a person. Who she loves is her choice. I can't force her. Besides, I never won. In this game of love, I was the one who lost completely. Is that so? Makoto stepped closer, and I noticed for the first time that he had been hiding one hand behind his back. A sense of foreboding washed over me. I started to step back, but it was too late. He suddenly drew a knife and lunged at me. Die. His face twisted with madness. If you die, Willow will be mine again. George, why should you be so happy? You deserve to die. He was too close, and I couldn't dodge in time. His bloodshot eyes were the last thing I saw as the blade came rushing toward me. But then, I was suddenly shoved aside by a strong force. The sound of the knife piercing flesh was muffled by the rain, and Makoto froze as he looked at Willow standing in front of him. His hand, still gripping the knife, began to tremble, and he stammered in panic. Willow, I stumbled as I turned around. Seeing the knife buried deep in Willow's abdomen, blood, diluted by the rain, ran down in pale pink streaks. She seemed not to notice the pain, only smiling as she looked at me. As long as you're safe, that's all that matters. Chapter 11 By the time we arrived at the hospital, Willow had already slipped into unconsciousness. She had lost too much blood and was immediately taken to the ICU for emergency treatment. Makoto was also taken away by the police who had arrived on the scene. It wasn't until the third day that Willow finally woke up. I walked into the hospital room, looking at her, feeling as if a thousand words were stuck in my throat, but I couldn't say a single one, she looked frail, her face as pale as paper, yet she still managed to force a weak smile, George, are you okay, my emotions were all over the place, why did you take that knife from me, her eyelashes fluttered downward, I don't know, I just didn't want you to get hurt, Makoto's knife had been aimed straight at my heart, it was sheer luck that Willow hadn't suffered a fatal wound, what are you going to do now, I suddenly asked, Willow quickly understood what I meant and gave a bitter smile. I'll do what needs to be done. Tell the truth. That was your husband in your past life. You even had a child with him. I sat down on the bed opposite hers. She replied softly. But he killed you. I fell silent. Willow coughed a few times, wincing in pain. Then, in a hoarse voice, she said, George, I really know I was wrong. I was so terribly wrong before. If, her voice broke, and her lips trembled uncontrollably. If I could change, would you? No. I cut her off, you saved me, but I also died because of you in the last life, at most, we're even, 
Even if you took that knife from me, it doesn't erase the hurt you caused me. Her eyes reddened, and she bit down hard on her lip to stifle her sobs. But George, you once said you would always love me. I suddenly felt so tired, letting out a bitter laugh. Willow, love can be worn out. You spent ten years wearing mine down, little by little, until it was all gone. Willow's face turned ashen, filled with helplessness and fear. George, you can't say that. You were the one who said you loved me first. Before leaving, I turned to look at her one last time. Willow had lost a lot of weight, and the hospital gown hung loosely on her frail frame. Her face still bore the features of the girl I once loved, but her soul had grown old. Perhaps we did love each other once, but the timing was all wrong. But now, I said quietly, Willow, I really don't love you anymore. As I walked out of the hospital room, I could still hear her desperate sobbing. But George, what am I supposed to do? Why did I come back to live again, just to hear you say you don't love me anymore? Then I might as well have died in the last life. I lowered my head, my eyes dry. I couldn't cry anymore, because all my tears had already been shed in the last life. I walked away quickly, leaving those anguished cries behind me. In the end, I heard them no more. Chapter 12 Willow didn't cover for Makoto. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for attempted murder. The university also expelled him. I heard that his mother couldn't handle the shock and committed suicide by jumping from a building. I didn't attend the trial. I had already come to understand why Makoto hated me so much. It wasn't really about Willow, it was more about his jealousy of me. Jealous that I had everything. So he tried every way to take Willow from me to prove that he could win against me. When he realized he had lost Willow too, he snapped. I heard that when he found out about his mother's death, he completely lost his mind, becoming delirious and even cursing out the judge during his sentencing. Naturally, I had arranged for someone to deliver the news of his mother's death to him. I also had my father pull some strings to ensure that Makoto received special attention in prison. I never forgot about the poisoning in my past life. In the end, he had to pay back what he owed me. Three years later, I married Anna. Both of our families placed great importance on the wedding, hosting a grand banquet. All the notable figures in the city were invited, making it a very prestigious event. Just as Anna and I were about to take the stage, my secretary hurried over, holding a red envelope. There was nothing written on it. Mr. Wong. There's a card inside this red envelope. I verified it, and it's real, but there's no name on it. He frowned and asked, what should we do about it? Anna and I exchanged a glance, both of us guessing who it was from. She smiled, well, if someone's so eager to give us money, we might as well accept it. At that moment, my phone buzzed with a message. It was from an unknown number, with no greeting, just a single sentence. If you ever stop loving her, come back. I'll be waiting for you forever. Anna scoffed. She can wait all she wants. Not even in the next life will she get what she wants. In front of her, I deleted the message and blocked the number. Let's go, I said, taking her hand and smiling slightly. Everyone's waiting for us. Those dark nights were finally behind me, and I would never look back again. Chapter 13, Willow's Perspective. When I saw George again, I froze. The man standing before me was the 20-year-old version of him, full of youthful energy, a stark contrast to the weary, lifeless man etched into my memory. I couldn't tear my eyes away from him, greedily drinking in the sight. It had been so long, so very long, since I had last seen George, when the butler told me he had died in my past life. I didn't believe him, not until I went back and saw his cold, lifeless body. It was strange. In that moment, I didn't feel anything at all. Everything around me faded away. For a few seconds, I couldn't see or hear anything. It wasn't until they frantically helped me up that I realized I had collapsed. Calmly, I asked the butler, did he leave any last words? The butler shook his head. The gentleman didn't say anything. Oh, so he hadn't left me a single word. But then again, there was nothing left to say between us. When we were young and in love, he spoke sweet words to me. Later, when we turned against each other, we dragged every hurtful truth out into the open, brutally lashing each other with them. He cursed me, saying I would die a miserable death. I called him pathetic. What else was there to say? The good and the bad had all been said, until there was nothing left. It was around that time that I started to feel a dull pain in my chest. At first, the pain was faint and subtle, not particularly sharp, but it soon began to spread like poison, boring holes through my heart. It felt as if my heart was being pierced a thousand times over, the pain so intense that I had to kneel to endure it. I looked at George, he lay there quietly on the bed, utterly unresponsive. If it had been before, even in our worst fights, he would have come over to check on me, no matter how angry he was, he was always that foolish, but this time, he didn't even spare me a glance. Of course, he was dead, completely dead. He would never appear before me again. As I thought this, I didn't feel sadness. It was as if I were thinking about someone else's problem. My body and mind had become disconnected, as though they belonged to someone else. 
separated from the heart that continued to ache, what should I do? Such a bother, I thought. I had a meeting scheduled for tomorrow. Now it would have to be delayed because I needed to arrange his funeral. Suddenly, I felt an itch in my throat, and after coughing a few times, I noticed the butler's horrified expression. He exclaimed in a panic, Madam, I looked down and saw small crimson spots on my chest. Whose blood is this? I wondered. Then the itching in my throat became unbearable, and I violently coughed up a mouthful of blood. The butler was frantic, trying to drag me to the hospital, but there was only one thought in my mind. Oh, so this is my blood. After George died, I didn't shed a tear. I even went home and packed up some of his things. He didn't have much for someone who once loved luxury. His room was now almost empty, with only a few pieces of cheap clothing from street markets. That's good, I thought. After all our entanglements, it's finally over. It wasn't until I opened the cabinet and saw the shelves full of medicated oils that something broke inside me. I remembered how, when I was working as a delivery driver, I had been in an accident and injured my leg every time it rained. The pain was unbearable. These medicated oils were specially made for me by someone George had found. I used to tease him for buying so many, and he would laugh while massaging my leg. What if they stopped making them one day? But after we got married, I rarely came home, and when I did, it was only to argue. I'd barely used these oils, not even half a bottle. Only then did it hit me that we did have some good times together. I had once thought he was wonderful too, but in the endless cycle of arguments and torment, all that was left of us was our ugliness. Suddenly, I felt a warm wetness on my face. I reached up and touched it. I didn't even realize when it happened, but my face was already covered in tears. After George died, I didn't forget him as quickly as I thought I would. Instead, he appeared in my dreams every night, as if deliberately torturing me. Sometimes, I dream of when we were young, and he'd cheerfully hand me a lunchbox. Willow, this is the best Wagyu beef my family's cook makes. How strange, back then, I only found him arrogant and annoying, but now I realize that his straightforward way of showing love was actually endearing. It wasn't until later that I learned the dish of Wagyu beef was his favorite. He wanted to share his favorite things with me, wholeheartedly and without reservation. But at that time, I wasn't worthy of such a precious love. My insecure, self-conscious heart was too sensitive, raising defenses that wounded anyone who tried to get close. George had a good family. He was handsome, and so many people liked him. I couldn't believe that he would actually love someone as worthless as me. Rich people had too many tricks up their sleeves. He must have been playing with me. So I treated him worse and worse. I wanted to push him away. He was like a rare creature that didn't belong in my bleak, dark world, throwing my entire ecosystem into disarray, leaving me at a loss. But I also wanted to selfishly confirm his love for me again and again, clinging to the hope that he wouldn't give up. How pathetic, and how hateful. After we got married, our relationship seemed to improve a little, but Makoto kept reminding me that he and I would never be part of the same world as George, and he was right. The first time I got some money, I was so excited to buy George a car, only to find out later that it was an outdated model a suitor had given him back in university. What was there about me for him to like? At the time, I didn't understand my own heart. I thought I genuinely hated him, but I couldn't help getting closer to him. I kept bringing Makoto around, showing up in front of George, and I sickly fed on the hurt in his eyes as if to reassure myself that he cared about me. Look, he does care about me. Later on, in my dreams, George changed again. He lay in a hospital bed, his eyes cold. He said, Willow, I don't love you anymore. And then I would wake up with a start, unable to sleep for the rest of the night. It happened night after night, sometimes leaving me happy other times terrified. I had no choice but to seek out a spiritual master. I asked him, Master, does he have some unfinished business? Do I need to perform a ritual to help him pass on? The master looked at me for a long time and then sighed. Lady, he said, clasping his hands together in a gesture of compassion. It's not him who's holding on. I sat on the mountain for a long time that day before I finally understood. It wasn't him who couldn't let go. It was me. It turned out I had fallen in love with him long ago. Three years after George's death, I started to lose my mind. I completely ignored Makoto and our child. No matter how much Makoto raged, I would only reply coldly. You insisted on having this child. It has nothing to do with me. On George's birthday, I took two bottles of sleeping pills with alcohol. To make sure it was final, I also slit my wrists. The excruciating pain slowly dulled. A gentle breeze suddenly passed in front of my eyes. The sunlight was warm, and I could hear birds chirping nearby. Soft fingers suddenly grasped mine. I turned my head and there he was, the twenty-year-old George, right in front of me. Willow, he said with a smile, what took you so long? I looked at him for a long time, and my vision began to blur with tears, then I slowly turned around and hugged him tightly, holding on as if my life depended on it. 
He was startled and pushed me away. What's wrong with you? Who bullied you? Then he hugged me back, laughing softly. What's gotten into you? Did you miss me? My voice broke with tears. Yes, George, I missed you. I missed you so, so much. I couldn't take it anymore. If only I could stay in that moment forever. It would be better than hearing him say he didn't love me anymore. It was in that moment that I realized the pain of being pierced by a thousand arrows was nothing compared to this. I lay in bed, crying until I was hoarse. If that's the case, why was I even brought back? I thought I could win him back, reverse our tragedy, but instead, I lost him completely. The pain in my chest was so overwhelming that I could barely breathe. I laughed and cried at the same time. I thought I had gone mad, but then I realized that I was more clear-headed than I had ever been. I clearly understood now. My rebirth was only for atonement. It was to make me endure all the suffering he had gone through. Death isn't the true departure. Now, he has truly left me for good, and I will live out the rest of my days in this endless despair, never to escape.